Now, Frank Luntz is standing by in our nation's capital with a focus group that may just have the answer. He is joined by a group of newly elected GOP members of Congress. Frank, take it away. John, this is what makes it worthwhile to be able to do events like this. I, I have to admit how proud I am to be able to talk to these new members right now, just before they get sworn in. Sean asked the question, he made the comment in the introduction, how do we know that you're going to stay true to your principles? You, you were re elected not just about what you are, but also what you were against. How do they know that they should trust you? Vicki? Well, because I'm one of them. And that's why I'm running is because Washington, D.C. is broken and it needs to be fixed. And Nancy Pelosi and crew were taking our country to ruin and they needed to be stopped. And the, my vo the voice of the people of the 4th was not being heard and they deserved better. And so that's why we ran and the 4th teamed with me. And as I think people across this country teamed with the good people who stood up to run. And uh, we're going to make a difference. You're only 32 years old. Right. You've barely been alive long enough to be a member yeah. of Congress. You know, Frank, I've been an Air Force pilot for about eight years. And uh, it's a job I love. I've been overseas a number of times. And the thing I've learned in all of that is we have an amazing country that's worth defending. Now, we have a lot of brave men and women defending her on the outside. Now we need some brave men and women defending her on the inside. And I think that's the call like of arms that. right there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the American people are trying to judge. They're going to look you straight in the eye to try to figure out whether you got what it takes. Absolutely. Do you? And I expect them to. Uh, that's what we ran on. I served here as a staff member, actually, before I went on to get elected. And you wanted to come back? And no, actually, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. My husband and I, we actually made a cross-country trek. We drove out here, and on the way, we were reminiscing. When we made the decision to run, it wasn't because we wanted to live here in Washington, D.C. I'm from the West Coast. I like the West Coast. But we decided our country needed a course correction. We either change directions now or future generations of Americans, my children's children, would, wouldn't have the same America I had, and it was worth it to us. And you're no from problem. Arizona. Right. It's a long way away. Why would you want to come to Washington, D.C., the most unpopular city in America, to an institution that right now has about a 13% approval rating? Why do you want to be part of this? Well, I want to know who the 13% is, because I, I, I didn't know who they were in Arizona. But, um, you know, I think that it, it comes down to this, is that if you have an opportunity to actually do something, to make a positive change for your country and make that sacrifice, then later down the line, when, you have, when I would have kids and see them and look at them in the eye and said, look, you know what, I took that opportunity. I took that chance to make our country better. And that's why I decided to run. You got six grandkids, right? Yes. They're going to be watching you tonight. And I'm angry about what's happened here in Washington. I'm really angry. I want my grandchildren to know the same kind of America and have the same kind of opportunities that I have had. And that's my reason for running. And that's my reason for sacrificing the time that I could be with them to be right here in Washington so I can make a difference. You served in the military for what, two decades? More than that? Yeah. You know discipline. Mm -hmm. You know accountability. Mm -hmm. The last time I checked, there wasn't either here in Washington. You know, the majority of my colleagues here have never been politicians. And we're here because we've got skin in the game. We have a future that we're here fighting for, and that's why we're here today. And I, I think it's safe to say that most of us who are here, we don't want a career in politics. Mm -hmm. We want to come down here now and change the course the country's on. And so with, with that in mind, you, it's easier to stick to your principles. As a, as a small business owner, I was consistently forced to make a decision between hiring more people or paying higher taxes. We can't do both. But what? Frank, make, I got, uh, go ahead. I've been reading financial statements for 30 years. And the reason You've got I got the into, nicest suit of anyone here. I, in the <laughs> and listen, I, uh, I got into this because I realized our country is at serious risk. Democrat, independent, Republican, we're all in this. That's true. And don't forget, to, Frank, to you and Sean's question, in a free republic, it's not for a citizenry to trust. It's for a citizenry to, number one, be involved, and number two, hold us accountable. And we're all up for that mission. Yeah. Hey, Frank, you mentioned the military. Um, yes, it's not an easy thing to come and leave your hometown and come to Washington. But it's not easy for these young men and women to go overseas to Afghanistan, to Iraq, and places that they don't really want to be, but they go to defend the greatest country in the world. And it's, it's an absolute disgrace that we can't do here on shore what they're doing over there. So it's, it's incumbent upon us to be held accountable for what we said we were going to do. Sean, I know you got a question. What can I relate to them? You know, uh, uh, Fr uh, Frank, I'm, I'm listening here, and, and I bet a pretty big percentage of our audience is agreeing with me. I like everything that I hear these new congressmen and women say, are saying. Uh, I know they're going to caucus with Republicans. 
but do they consider themselves, maybe you can ask a show of hands, more conservative or more Republican? Oh, great question. <laughs> I'm going to put you on. It's easy? <laughs> How many of you consider yourselves Republicans first? Raise your hands. Not all at once, please. <laughs> How many of you consider yourselves conservatives first? So for you, it's the policy and the ideology, not the party? But, but you know what, Frank? Go ahead. I think it's extremely important to note something. I consider myself, and I, I'm going to probably speak for almost everyone here, an American first. We're Americans. It's, it's not, we, we have become way too polarized, and we have to get past that. And what the Republican Party stands for, less government, cut spending, get people back to work, and that belief in the private sector. If we follow through on that, that's a great platform. If we don't, that's the problem. But what about, what about yeah. cooperation? What about cooperation? We, we all were out talking to voters, and we're going to be back talking to voters real soon. We get, a lot, we get to run again in two years. And I will tell you that the voters are small-c conservative, too. They want freedom and liberty, and they want government just to go away. I, I was a small business president before I came to this, and uh, they, they just want government to go away and leave them alone, and thank you very much. They'll do just fine. Sean's going to hold on. Sean, another question. Yeah, you know, uh, Frank, I, I agree with the comment. I, we're all Americans. But there, is, there are radically different views that we have about the vision of the country. Some of the members there have, have mentioned those differences. How do, what, where can you get the common ground? Either you believe in lower taxes, limited government, or like the president, you want more government intervention, uh, higher taxes, etc. I don't, I don't know how we reconcile those things. Can they achieve, can they achieve common ground? Bipartisanship and compromise are not inherently virtuous. Uh, I, I prefer the phrase common ground. If, if the president or this administration uh, want to come towards us, then, then I'm happy with civility to, to talk to him. But we're not going to sacrifice our core beliefs. With respect to Obamacare, if you do not believe that the federal government can mandate you to purchase health insurance, where would you like us to compromise? Now, you're, you're nodding your head. For the I civility am. or for the compromise? No, for the civility in, in trying to, to work with the administration, if they're willing to come to us. But in, in my, I come from the coal fields of Virginia, and if, if the idea is to put Appalachia out of business, then we can't, we can't compromise on that. And we have to defend... The question becomes... Right. One of, the question becomes one of common ground with whom. What we want is common ground with the American people. We have to find a way to build a consensus around the American people's vision of the future and not a political vision. In the back, one last comment. I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that, that still hangs in my mind is it's not so much that we won as they lost. And, and if we don't do right by the American public, then two years from now we're going to lose. Okay, that's a great way to end this. I want you to hand me this painting. This was done frankly, Sean, by my favorite artist, Steve Penley. And it's Abraham Lincoln, and he ran this country at a time of great division. We're not facing a war right now, but there's, people aren't talking to each other. And when we come back, I want to know from them exactly how they plan to run this dialogue. You guys like this? Like what it represents? How they plan to communicate and how they plan to deal with these tough issues going forward. Back to you. All right, fascinating stuff. Uh, we're going to have more Frank Luntz. And on the eve of the 112th Congress, we are joined by Frank Luntz and a group of newly elected GOP members of Congress. And we continue now with our freshman focus group, Frank. John, while we were in the break, a couple members talked to me about their, what's going on in terms of bipartisanship and cooperation. And I want to go because you don't come from a Republican district. And you're also one of the most, you're one of the youngest members of this new yeah. conference. Yeah. Absolutely. I, one of the things I think it's important we remember, when Republicans had their chance not too many years ago, they had the White House, they had the House and the Senate, Republicans spent big. Um, and they made a lot of poor decisions. So when we had the chance to repeal or to put in free market solutions for health care, Republicans passed on it. So yes, I, I mean, I, I'm not one that says we need to, to cut loose and, and do everything that the, the other side says, but we have to recognize it's, it's not Republican or Democrat here. We need to be fighting for real solutions. Do you guys agree with this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think when we talked about sticking to our principles, Sean brought that up. And I think if you look at the size of this class, it's historic. And we can have a lot of clout. And as long as we are cohesive and we agree, and it sounds like we do agree in principle, we will be a successful 112th Congress. Unity and organization is the key. I am one vote from Indiana, but there's 87 of us here who are coming, and we can be a very powerful block. And Frank, Frank, there's, there, there's common sense things to do as well. I mean, an issue that's important to me is, is repatriating profits that we're making to come back and invest in America. 
I mean, this is the kind of a thing. It's not controversial. So you're calling for it an end to corporate ability. welfare? Uh, it's not corporate welfare. It's taking those dollars and giving them an the ability to come back and invest in creating jobs here rather than creating jobs overseas. Ben. But I think the one thing that you've got to look at, it. this isn't a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. This is a math issue when we're talking about our debt and our unfunded liabilities. We have $14 trillion of debt and anywhere from 50 to 70, 80 trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities due to our entitlement program. So this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's just the numbers don't work. Well, you have Frank to understand, I flunked calculus, so. <laughs> hey, hey, Frank, math is this simple, Frank. You know, orientation, they gave us a, a laptop computer. And as a businessman, they handed it to me. It's probably a $1,000 computer. And all I could think of was $600 of it was paid for, $400 of it was put on a credit card. And I thought about that every point in our orientation. We can't stay on this path. It's going to put all of us at risk. John, they're talking about accountability, they're talking about spending. What would you like to know from them? You know, as I'm listening, Frank, um, I, I love the talk about standing on limited government constitutional first principles, because I too identify myself as a conservative first. Um, the ways of Washington are often corrupting, even with people with the best of intentions. And as, as they begin their new careers tomorrow, I wanted to ask them, one of the first tests they're going to have is on the issue of raising the debt ceiling. Um, and there's going to be talk and, and uh, fear that the full faith and trust of the federal government is going to be in jeopardy. There's going to be talk about are you willing to shut down the government. And I wanted to find out where they stand on that issue. Okay. Who wants to, who wants to start? You know, Go ahead. I'll tell you what I'll, I'll say about that. My, my grandfather used to tell me me measure twice and cut once. And I think that the thing we have to do there is make sure that we have all the facts and that we're completely honest with the general public about where we are and, and what the result is of voting to raise it and what the result is of not voting and to raise it. And have they been honest up to this point? I, I don't think that we have the facts. No, I don't, I don't, I don't trust I what I've been told to yet. I just don't think we have, I mean, we get sworn in tomorrow. We haven't been serving. We, we're starting to get the facts now. Look, we've got to stop spending in this country. You don't start a diet by uh, going to the drive through window. We've got to stop spending. That one time. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you and I saw each other there. <laughs> Not a zip code, yeah, but I tell you what, what, what Corey's talking about is so important, though, that if we start looking at spending cuts first and not talk about increasing the debt ceiling, let's talk about the spending cuts that are necessary to avoid it. If we can make some systematic changes to the way that we do government in D.C., maybe we'll seize an opportunity not to raise a cap. It should I'm, not start which there. Is, which is go, t t Tim is correct, and that's going to necessitate a debate on the size and scope of Absolutely. government, federal government juxtaposed with state government, juxtaposed with individual personal responsibility, and that is a debate that I think all of the freshmen welcome. Well, here's the deal. Sean, I'm hoping that we can come back and talk to them after 100 days. Let's no, see what I would they've love done. To do that. Let's, let's but, see but, what the vote is. Go ahead. Yeah, but I, 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 I don't want to belabor a point, but I really think this is going to be important because, because of all their talk of principle, which I'm, I'm excited and inspired about. Um, and if I was another host, I'd have a tingly feeling running up my, down my leg right now. Uh, but but in, all, in all seriousness, when it comes down to this vote, are they willing to say we'll shut down the government? Are they willing to say we're, we're, unless we get spending cuts, there will be no increase in the debt ceiling? You got it? Easy answer is yes. This easy answer, yes. Yeah, and I, I think, too, I think the, the calamity that reaching that credit card cap, that debt ceiling that the administration is going to tell us that the world will end, I, I'm not convinced. That's right. Same thing. You, you still have to be cognizant of the fact, though, that this is a massive problem that is, has happened over a long period of time. And if we're expecting to come in and within a month, or in a few days make everything better, then we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. We have to be honest and open. And I think the American people realize the gravity and magnitude of this issue. And it's not going to be as easy as just saying yes and no, uh, because it, I'm not going to make a decision that's imprudent Frank, and is going to be irresponsible. Shut government. We showed in Indiana that they're exactly. cutting 15%. It's a good opportunity to embrace the debate. We, uh, that's what we're doing here. It's de about debt and deficit and spending. You're going to have the last word. The size of the federal government has just grown out of control. And I think that's the overarching question is, how big does the federal government or the central government need to be? Well, let me be clear. You're going to be asked to answer that question. People are going to be watching what happens over the next 100 days. Sean, you've made television history here. The first time that we've gathered this many people on live television, newly elected members of Congress, to talk about where they stand, where they sit. This is very special. Back to you.